breaking the chain of causation when we're talking about the power electric a public court decision that came down a few weeks ago we're lucky enough to have the lawyer who handled the case um, with us today here to decide from Rumson Makarowski is with us this afternoon so as soon as I deal with a few preliminary matters we're going to get him up here to talk about the car electric case. So what I wanted to do before we got into the subject of this afternoon's program is just give a brief, a very quick legislative update. We had our Whitwell board meeting yesterday and it was discussed among the board members that it might be a good idea to just quickly give the members a legislative update. And of course, the most important part of the legislative update is what happened yesterday. And I'm sure you all by now know the results of that. Two uh, people who are familiar to you and, and you know through your experience at the Workers' Compensation Commission had some results uh, yesterday that if you haven't, haven't seen them, you, you should know about now. Former Wood Club President Danny Gatsky won his race for state representative, so congratulations to Representative Danny Gatsky. And also, yeah. uh, you may have, know by now that arbitrator Kathy Stephan won her race for Cook County Judge. So. So that, that's the most important legislative update that I, I, I can give you. But seriously, I wanted to talk about a couple of bills that we've talked about before here that were amended for the by the governor. And then I want to talk really quickly about two bills that have become law that you all need to know about because they do have if not a direct effect, at least some indirect effect on our workers' compensation cases. So the first bill I want to talk about is Senate Bill 904. And if you can remember from when we talked about it when the bill passed the General Assembly, this is the bill that deals with payment of medical bills. And it did a few things. What this bill did was require payers to issue an explanation of benefits to the providers. So if they were paying the bill or partially paying the bill or denying the bill, this requires the for uh, payers to issue explanations of benefits to the providers. This bill also gave a cause of action to the provider in circuit court for a collection of the 1% per month interest. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second here. And finally, the bill required the Commission and the Department of Insurance to, pro to fully promulgate all the rules for electronic billing for providers by January 1, 2019. The bill passed both houses of the General Assembly by pretty overwhelming margins, as you can see here. And we talked about that when we talked about the passage of the bill. But subsequent to that, on August 28th, the governor mandatorily vetoed the bill and what that means is that instead of just vetoing the bill outright, what the governor did was make changes um, to the bill. We talked about the civics of you know the Illinois government in here before, so I don't have to go uh, on with that. But the governor did change the uh, Senate Bill 904. So the reason why I'm bringing this up now is that uh, we understand that there's probably going to be some effort to override the governor's amendatory veto here in the next couple of weeks. The General Assembly will reconvene in about a week, and then we'll reconvene a week after that um, for about six days or so. This is called the veto session, and this is where the General Assembly considers the governor's veto. And, and I think one of the vetoes that the General Assembly is going to be considering is Senate Bill 904, and that's because the Illinois State Medical Society has uh, instigated a, an effort to override the governor's veto of this bill, and I think they're at least going to get some type of hearing on that. So I, I just give you a couple of slides here on some important differences between how the bill passed the uh, General Assembly and what the mandatory veto did. So I kind of tried to line the, the different things up side by side. You'll notice on um, the last sentence, 
Um, in section 8.2 D3 tells you when the interest is payable, right? The interest is payable within 30 days after payment of the bill. So that's when the interest is payable. When does the interest run? Well, under current law, um, the interest runs 30 days after the payer receives the bill. So there's your kind of bookends of when the interest begins to run and when the interest is payable. 30 days after receipt of the bill, 30 days, 30 days of payment, that's when the interest is running. So what Senate Bill 904 did to pass the General Assembly was give the provider a cause of action um, in the circuit court for the um, collection of the interest. Um, you'll also see that in Senate Bill 904 to pass the General Assembly, the collection of the interest was something that was given directly to the provider, right? And it says specifically in Senate Bill 904 that that has nothing to do with the petition, right? The petitioner is not responsible for the collection of the interest. The petitioner um, does not have to pay the interest to anybody. That the petitioner is left out of the equation altogether because what Senate Bill 904 was give the provider a direct cause of action in the circuit court to collect the interest. What the governor's amendatory veto did was to delete that language and reinsert language that said that instead of giving the provider a cause of action in the circuit court, a separate cause of action where the provider was the plaintiff and the, the payer was the defendant, it gave the provider some type of proceeding in the workers at the workers' compensation commission. Unclear whether that was in the petitioner's underlying workers' compensation case or whether it was a separate case. Um, but the concern with, with doing it that way was that to even imply or give any hint that somehow the provider had standing in the petitioner's underlying workers' compensation case. Um, some, some people think that that's not such a great idea to just talk about additional delay or talk about additional you know, trouble. If you give a, a third party even some implicit standing in the petitioner's underlying workers' compensation case, there were, there, some people think that there could be a lot of issues with that. So that kind of comparison to, be, to what Senate Bill 904 did as it passed the General Assembly and what the governor of the Unemployed Deal did, stay tuned because I, I really do think that there's going to be a push to override the amendatory deal, which means that Senate Bill 904 as it passed the General Assembly would be the law. All right? So, any questions about that? Any uh, comments? Yes, sir. What was the WCLA's position on the initial bill and on the amendatory veto? Oh, the WCLA doesn't take positions on substantive legislation like this. We do contribute money to candidates, though, don't we? Uh, yes. But, but understand there's a difference between procedural issues, right, that, that affect lawyers and substantive issues like this, so. All right. Um, yes, sir. Real question. With regard to the way that the uh, medical issue was originally written, um, did you see any difficulty with the fact that the confusion was created about what you can go with the provider to go to the circuit court with? That is, can the circuit court certainly some uh, room for ambiguity. I, I agree with you. Um, I can tell you clearly the intent was only to, was to allow the circuit court to only address the issue of interest, not to address the reasonableness and necessity of the underlying bill, or to address the issue of causation or relatedness or anything like that, right? It was solely to address the issue of interest, right? 
And there, there is some discussion going on right now that there might be something called a trailer bill to this, which is just a way of kind of clarifying that underlying intent. And that trailer bill might say something like, this circuit court proceeding is limited simply to the collection of the interest, and you cannot address any of the other underlying issues. Whoever you get, whoever your contact with, whoever you're drafting that, if you want to see the letter, you know, let them go across the street, the Daily Center, go up to the Supreme Court, you know, who's got jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera. It's so easy to fix that. Yeah, and, and there, there was some thought that, you know, the, the, the intent had been addressed by this kind of last sentence here in section. Uh, 4 of 8.2d, where it says the right to interest under this section shall not delay, diminish, or strip, or in any way, you know, alter the workers' compensation case, but I guess, you know, that good intentions only go so far, right? So, right? so um, and, and then the other, the other part of it was this idea of when does the interest become payable, right? Under current law, the interest becomes payable within 30 days of payment of the bill. So I, I can imagine a situation where E even if they had the right to, to this cause of action, which those Marquis Manicos cases in the appellate court said they don't, you know, those Marquis. But one of the reasons for this bill in the first place was those Marquis Manicos cases, right, which said to the providers, yeah, you've got this great right of 1% per month interest, but you don't have any way to collect it, right? There's no, there's no cause of action that you can bring to collect your, your interest. So that's why this was put in there. So I can imagine a situation where even under current law, which is not changed in any way by Senate Bill 904, where a provider brings a cause of action to collect the interest before the bill is paid, right? Before the bill is resolved. And there might be a motion to dismiss at that time by the defendant, which would say this isn't right yet, right? It's not, is the word just, justiciable or whatever, right? It's, it's not right yet because the, the statute itself says the interest is not payable until 30, within 30 days of the payment of the bill. And payment, I, I would presume, means some type of resolution of the bill, including issues like causation, reasonableness and necessity, you know, negotiated rate or whatever, right? So you're, you're, you're right on point that there was this concern that somehow the circuit court's jurisdiction was greater than what was intended, and there may be a specific bill to clarify that. And it's just the interest. That's all we're talking about. Yes? Yeah, so Dave, um, going back to this gentleman's question about policy positions with the WCLA, <coughs> so our, our membership dues of $200, does any of that go to candidates? Or candidate funding is a separate like fundraising of the WCLA? No, I mean, uh, please, please look at your membership application. It's, it's pretty clear on the membership application. Um, Senate Bill 1737, um, which is the insurance bill that we talked about here previously. So this one had to do with insurance overpayments, pre-filing of rates. Um, the, the one thing that was interesting about this bill was that it also required insurance companies to give premium increase notices to their insurers if the uh, premium was going to be more than 5% above the NCCI recommended rate. So for example, NCCI has recommended an additional 8.5% reduction for January of 2019. So unless premium went down by 3.5% uh, or more, I mean, a carrier would have to give notice to its insured about why that reduction was not being made and have to explain the reason um, behind the you know, variance between the NCCI recommended rate and what the premium was. This again cast both houses um, with a little less overwhelming uh, majorities. It was part of a comprehensive kind of insurance uh, regulation bill that had to do with reinsurers and captive insurance companies and a lot of complicated um, insurance issues. The governor uh, mandatorily vetoed this bill to take out all of the references regarding workers' compensation. So he left all those other complicated insurance issues regarding reinsurance and captive insurance companies and so forth. But he took out all the workers' compensation changes. And I, 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 don't, have, I don't have a good sense, unless somebody else here does, um, of whether there's going to be an effort to override this mandatory deal or not. So, um, but 
that part of the bill has been stripped out by the amendment for the deal. Two bills that were actually signed into law that have at least some indirect impact on workers' compensation are the Direct Access to Physical Therapy Act, which you may have heard about by now, but what this law now does is allow physical therapists to treat patients directly. Right? There's no requirement that a medical provider of any sort refer a patient to a physical therapist. Now a patient can walk into a, under this new law, a patient can walk into a physical therapy clinic and say, give me treatment, and can receive treatment directly from the physical therapist without ever seeing any other kind of medical provider, at least for a limited period of time, and you can see the, the limitation here. But this uh, bill, law now, uh, brings up some issues for us, right? Choice of provider, right? If, if, my, if a petitioner decides to use a physical therapist as his urgent aid clinic, so to speak, is that considered to be a choice of provider? Um, maybe, maybe not. You know, what about um, histories that petitioners might give to physical therapists? Now, you know, just the same way as initial histories in the emergency room or to an urgent care provider or something. So it, it's, some, it's, it's, it's a, a change in the law that I think is going to have at least some impact on our practices. The last bill that has now been made, yes, Tom. Was there any question before we talk about the capacity evaluation? So Tom asks, would this include performing functional capacity evaluations? Um, maybe so, right? I mean, maybe so, but... Um, well, and, and so, so John brings up the fact that a referral is required for an FCE. Well, clearly under, the, under this new law, a referral is required at all. Whenever you see a physical therapist, you can walk you can now walk into a physical therapy clinic under this current law and say, please give me treatment. And the physical therapist can give you treatment. You don't need a diagnosis. You don't need a referral from any other medical provider. Right? So I, I can see some situations where petitioners are picking a physical therapy clinic as their first provider, right? Kind of using it as an emergent aid clinic. I mean, um, and I, I, I don't mean any disrespect for our sponsors, but you can't drive, you can't drive down a street without seeing a physical therapy clinic, right? So maybe you get hurt at work, and instead of driving all the way to the hospital, right, you, you pull over into the, into the parking lot of the physical therapy clinic, right, to get your initial, to get your initial medical treatment. So it, it's just something that I think we're going to see more and more of the work. So the last one I want to mention really quickly is this alternative to Opioids Act of 2018. And this is going to have some impact on our practice because although there are some diagnoses in the medical marijuana law that already would cover some of our clients, right? The, the idea of kind of chronic pain is not included as one of the conditions for which medical marijuana can be prescribed under current law. But I think this law may change that, right? Because what this law now says is that if you are a patient who has been prescribed or could have been prescribed an opioid, okay, that under those circumstances alone, without having the, the diagnosis that's included in the medical marijuana, that, that under those circumstances alone, you can apply for a medical marijuana card. Okay? So we may see more and more petitioners and workers applying for medical marijuana cards under the, uh, this new law. And under those circumstances, we're going to have to be dealing with the reimbursement issues, right? Which um, there's already an issue regarding that because the federal law, right? The, 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 the feds still say, don't be buying marijuana because if you are, you're breaking the law, right? And uh, don't insurance companies don't be reimbursing people for marijuana, right? Because if you do, you're breaking the law, right? Because you know, that check that you write for reimbursement comes out of a federally insured bank, and guess what? You're breaking federal law by, by writing that check for reimbursement. So um, I think we're going to see more and more petitioners being 
give them medical marijuana cards under this opioids. And, and that was the purpose of this, right? The purpose was to get, get, get them off the opioids, right, which are really, really super bad and really super expensive, and, and get them onto medical marijuana, which maybe is less bad and maybe a little less um, expensive, um, but we're still going to be dealing with the reimbursement issue. So I think we're going to see a frequency of those situations with uh, the clients you know, that we represent and defend against, and but we're still going to have the reimbursement issues that we're going to have to work our way through. Yes? There, I, I forget the section, but isn't there some other section of the act that says that you know, marijuana is not reimbursed? And then how, does the, how do these two sections, if this passes, how are they going to mesh with each other? Well, with the workers' compensation act, you mean? Yeah. No, I, I'm not aware of, is anybody aware of anything in the Workers' Compensation Act that says that specifically medical marijuana shall not be reimbursed, right? It's in the medical marijuana. Right, so, so right, it, it's in the medical marijuana act, right? And, and this, this bill does, didn't touch any of that, right? It didn't, it didn't touch, it didn't say for this special opioids program, you know, you can reimburse, right? It, it just said, it didn't, it didn't mention that at all. So we're still getting out, I think we still have those reimbursement issues, even though I think we'll see a frequency maybe of some injured workers on, on medical marijuana. Because it's this, it's this idea of, you know, are prescribed an opioid or could have been prescribed an opioid, right? So it's, it gets a pretty broad category, I think. Right? Okay, good. All right, so let's get into why we all really came here. <laughs> So why we all really came here today was to hear about the power electric case, which deals, uh, which deals with intervening um, injuries and breaking the chain of causation. In order to get to the power electric case, we have to quickly review a couple of really important decisions that we all kind of cite, um, but we should every once in a while just go back and refresh our recollection about what those decisions actually hold. So Volvo was a public court case in which it was decided that the subsequent injuries right, were not intervening, were not intervening injuries that cut off the chain of causation to the original work accident. Right? So Vogel is a case where it's not an intervening injury. And here are the facts of Vogel, right? You got a work-related injury in 1998, confusion in 1999, nine, um, un not work-related uh, motor vehicle um, accident uh, after the fusion, um, you know, a, a return to work, a couple of other motor vehicle uh, accidents. And of course, the uh, respondent in this case is arguing, look, those subsequent motor vehicle accidents are independent, intervening injuries that cut off the chain of causation to the original work-related injury, right? Now those, in this, in the local case, it happened to be subsequent injuries that were not work-related, right? They were called private motor vehicle accidents, but they were not work-related. Um, and we're gonna see how that's different from um, national trade and, and how it plays into the power of electric case. But um, here, here are, here are, here's how Vogel went down, right, in, at the work, at the commission and in the appellate court. At the end of the day, what the appellate court said is that the long-standing case law in Illinois is that um, a subsequent injury does not cut off the chain of causation to the original work accident. If but for the original work accident, but for, that's the kind of language that's used in Vogel, but for the original work accident, the petitioner would not have needed this not to treat, right? So it's this kind of but for, right? So what Vogel stands for is the proposition, and we'll see that again in National Trade and Power Electric, is this idea that the intervening injury has to completely, and that's another word that's used in, in the case, completely cut off the chain of causation to the work injury. It can't just kind of be a flip on the radar or a little, you know, aberration. It's got to completely cut off the chain of causation. Otherwise, that chain of causation remains, and whatever treatment or disability the petitioner sustains after the subsequent accidents is still connected to the original work injury. National Freight Industries is the result is the opposite, right? In national trade injuries, the result is the opposite. In the national trade injuries, the appellate court ultimately decides that the subsequent injuries are, in fact, 
independent intervening injuries that cut off the chain of causation to the work injury. In national freight, it just so happens that the subsequent injury was also a work-related injury, right? So different from Bobo, where those motor vehicle accidents were not work-related, right? In, in national freight, it, it happens that the subsequent injuries were work-related, right? So the appellate court um, goes through the facts of national freight, as they're listed here, and um, says that the um, you know, every the, the natural consequence of an injury is, you know, that flows from the original injury is connected to the original injury unless there's this independent intervening injury. And the appellate court says these are manifest weight of the evidence questions. So if the evidence supports the commission's determination that it's an intervening injury that cuts off the chain of causation, then that's how the appellate court is going to analyze these cases. So, um, gets us to pyroelectric, and I may have Jigger come uh, down here now and, and talk a little bit about this. But here, here are the facts of uh, the pyroelectric case. So you can see that, um, in this case, the petitioner, whose name is Dallas Ham, had, had an injury with pyroelectric on June 16, 2014. Um, he had surgery on his right shoulder about three months later, connected to that work-related injury. Um, ultimately, he has a functional capacity evaluation, shows he's only able to do medium work. He's an apprentice electrician, I, I want to say, so he has to do pretty heavy work. Um, but that was one of these kind of uh, preliminary functional capacity evaluations. So they said, yeah, you're not as good as you could be, but if you go through eight weeks or whatever it is of work conditioning, you're going to get better, you're going to be able to go back to work. Ultimately, even though he doesn't have the kind of follow-up functional capacity evaluation, the treating doctor, Dr. Lee, releases Mr. Ham to return to work for a different employer. He goes back to work for a different employer, and within a week or eight days or nine days, he has a new injury with that um, employer. The new injury, the, the first injury was he slips in a bucket, lifts, goes to grab with his arm, you know, and, and feels the tear and that's so a pretty clear injury. The, the subsequent two injuries with the new employer are him throwing a, a roll of tape up to a co-worker and throwing a set of uh, snippers up to a co-worker. Both times he says he kind of feels the um, shoulder slip out of place. So um, his lawyer, the, the good traditional lawyer that he is, files two new cases on those you know, tossing um, incidents, um, and that's when the fun begins, right? So he he has uh, he has uh, a subsequent surgery to the to the right shoulder, and I'm sure you're going to tell you about all the, the differences in the, in the medical condition. But um, in this case, the arbitrator says, "Look, you sustained three concurrent injuries." Um, and the arbitrator said that the second respondent, right, the second respondent was responsible for everything that happened after, right, after those two subsequent injuries, right? So the arbitrator found that those injuries were intervening, independent causes that cut off the chain of causation to the original um, injury um, with our um, electric. Well, the commission uh, said, just the opposite, right? The commission said the arbitrator's wrong. The, um, in fact, under these particular circumstances, there, um, these were not um, intervening injuries, and the chain of causation remains with power electric, and um, that's where trigger comes in. So, thank you. So, uh, on review of the commission, the commission reverses uh, cites the vocal in support of their findings. They, the commission affirms the arbitrator finding, or the arbitrator's findings that there were three distinct accidents, but finds that Mr. Hens' condition, even after the April 2015 throwing incident, uh, to his right shoulder was all causally related to the accident that he experienced while working for my client, Paul Electric. 
uh, and the commission cites the Vogel in support of their decision. And, and, and the Vogel um, case law, as they pointed out, does indicate that uh, a subsequent accident seems to completely break the chain of causation, and that if the uh, and, and that there's a but for analysis, meaning that but for the initial injury while working for far life, there could be subsequent to going incidents have occurred, and the commission found that. The, the far electric injury contributed to the development of uh, its subsequent right shoulder condition following these throwing incidents. We appealed to the circuit court, the circuit court affirmed, and then we appealed to the appellate court. Um, before the appellate court, we made the argument that uh, the case law uh, in assessing causation is inconsistent. For example, under a normal analysis where there's a pre existing condition, the question is, did the work accident cause or contribute to a further worsening of that pre-existing condition? In intervening accident cases where we have a subsequent work-related accident, the question is not, but for this pre-existing work accident, or I'm sorry, the question is not, uh, but for this pre-existing condition, excuse me, the question is, it's split. It is, but for this pre-existing condition, would the subsequent work accident have occurred? thereby allowing the subsequent employer to deny the subsequent claims and assess causation on the initial employer. So, in the case of uh, 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 a petitioner who had a pre-existing injury to his right shoulder with surgery who subsequently returned to work, and this is an unrelated work accident, the first, the first condition, for example, he returns back to work as these two throwing incidents for Hankel's, where both the treater and the IME agree and testify that but for these throwing incidents, he wouldn't have dislocated his shoulder, he wouldn't have had a slap there, he wouldn't have needed additional surgery. The arbitrator's commission would have likely found that these two throwing incidents caused the need for subsequent treatment and awarded benefits to the petitioner and against Nichols and the court. But because we still have an open comp place, my client Par Leifert, because there was an initial work accident, the causation standard is now flipped on its head, meaning that our electric needs to establish that this pre-existing condition of his that was the result of our work accident had absolutely no connection to the subsequent development of his right shoulder condition following these throwing incidents. The appellate court was intrigued, but ultimately, as you can see, rejected our argument. Um, one of the other issues that we had with it is uh, and, and why we thought our case was distinguishable from cases such as Vogel that involved non-work-related subsequent accidents is that our case involved a subsequent, two subsequent work-related accidents that the commission found occurred. And if you review the case law regarding intervening uh, accidents, you'll see uh, that the appellate court at some point in time inserted whether work-related or not language in the context of this but for analysis. But if you look at all of those case law, all of those prior cases where this language is inserted, every single one of those appellate court cases involve non-work-related subsequent accidents, not subsequent work-related accidents. So at some point in time, this whether work-related or not, language got inserted into the case law, and the appellate court has reaffirmed it consistently since then, and now in par electric. So the appellate court rejected that aspect of the argument. Uh, about the causation standard being applied inconsistently, um, essentially in pre-existing condition cases, um, and also found that the commission's decision wasn't against the manifest way of the evidence, which was our secondary argument, although we didn't think that they would have reversed it as against the manifest way of the evidence. Um, and, 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 and that's, that's the nature of the case. So I think, I think one thing that could have been beneficial Noting the appellate court's uh, decision that there's no that this is not the law in Illinois and that there was no case law to support our position is uh, perhaps a analysis of how other states handle subsequent work-related accidents in the context of an intervening accident analysis. Um, I don't have the answer to that as to how they do, but uh, it might be helpful. Ultimately, we think there might be some room to make this argument to the appellate court under a different fact scenario. Uh, and uh, if uh, other jurisdictions handle subsequent work-related accidents differently in the context of an intervening uh, accident analysis. Any questions? When Fisher's attorney wrote up the proposed plan is that he proposed three separate accidents, or did he tie up the end of the cross-connection? 
He put it on. Do you think factually if there had been a six month return to work for Hankel with no treatment in between, the decision would have been different? Um, I think that the commission's decision might have been different. I'm not sure if the adult court's decision would have been different. I mean, ultimately, as employers, we have great difficulty getting the adult court to reverse commission decisions as against the manifest way of the evidence. Whereas you, you see in Bowl and other recent cases over the years that the adult court's more inclined to reverse commission decisions as against the manifest way of the evidence in favor of the employee. But I don't think. I think if the commission's decision was what it was, whether it's a six month gap or one year gap, the appellate court would have affirmed it. So ultimately, I think uh, you know, it's up to the commission to, to make the decision. The appellate court's going to affirm, affirm it, especially if. Uh, so, do you think the commission decision would have been different? Potentially. Potentially, I think the commission's decision could have been different if there was a six month or one year gap. The commission found it significant that he was informally placed at MMI despite the fact that he had a full duty release with no recommendations for further treatment or surgery. Um, one other aspect I'd point out about Bar Electric, which is which the appellate court correctly noted is that National Freight does not set out specific factors for assessing whether or not an intervening accident occurred, although I attempted to argue that the appellate court should adopt them in the context of a subsequent work-related intervening accident analysis. Uh, I thought that would provide a, a better way for the commission to assess whether or not an intervening accident broke the chain of causation. But again, they, they rejected that argument as well. No, but both of them, but Dr. Lee, who's the treater in our IV doctor, Dr. Blood, agreed was that, but for the throwing incident, the sex, the two subsequent accidents, Mr. Hand wouldn't have dislocated his shoulder, extended his labral tear, required additional surgery. Okay, and those were, was that reports or was it work that statement on that? Deposition. I mean, ultimately, the treater concluded that if he hadn't had the initial injury while working for PAR, he wouldn't have had the subsequent dislocation episodes, too. And the commission relied on that to, you know, conclude that there, there wasn't a break in the So that, that very well could have been the persuasive issue. For the commission? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think the fact that he had just been returned to work and then, and then these two subsequent incidents happened within one or two weeks, he wasn't formally placed in I don't think so, although it might happen in this case that the appellate court reversed because uh, the petitioner's attorney did not timely file a cross appeal um, on the subsequent two uh, cases, so they ended up uh, granting the co respondent's motion to dismiss the cross appeal. So it could have adversely affected them in this case, but otherwise, no, and there would have been. There would have been covered, there would have been impaired. There were no disputes uh, that he had these two subsequent accidents ultimately. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this is usually the case. So, did, did everybody get that? Because I think there's some really good practice that the rules of communications would be out one more time to think about what the petitioner did. Right, I mean, after, after the circuit court decision was rendered, we appealed to the appellate court, uh, we appealed our case to the appellate court. Petitioner's attorney didn't did file cross appeals of the two subsequent cases, but it was not timely filed. Co-respondent filed a motion to dismiss the cross appeals. The appellate court granted the motion to dismiss. So those two those two appeals were gone. So ultimately, when we're going up before the appellate court, I mean they don't have anybody else to assign blame to at this point. <coughs> Which I, I don't think that influenced the decision. They, they, laid it, they laid it all on number one? They found they were accidents, but they found that his condition was causally related to our, to the initial accident for my time, not the subsequent two accidents. Okay, thanks. 
the, 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 during surgery, it was found to have extended vagal tear and anchor lesions and some new findings uh, that weren't present during the first surgery, for the treatment. So there are definitely new objective findings. to say whether that would have led the, the commissioners to conclude differently and ultimately I think the commissioners you know uh, factually speaking um, there was no dispute that this was these two throwing incidents were uh, non normal everyday activities he was throwing them up 15 feet um, and Actually, by admission of the treater and the IME doctor, there was no dispute that these two throwing incidents caused the dislocation episode, resulting in the extension of the label there and the loose and anger. So I think ultimately the commission actually you know, had concluded it was an accident, but could find differently regarding causation. So maybe yes, you know, if he had fallen 15 feet to the ground and, and, and had a shoulder pain after that, the commission may have concluded differently. But it, it's it's difficult to say that wasn't the that, that wasn't what happened. Yes. Uh, which actor, which job uh, would have benefited the entire suit? For example, if his first job required no less than more than twenty pounds, but his second job required to lift up to fifty. If he gets released to twenty pounds, can you now cut off the because he would be full duty for the job because he already did. That would be 
hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's, he, he ended up going back to the same job, so it wasn't like something he had to address here. He's going to print, print this line in the same physical job demands. Um, but, but yeah, certainly we would argue that, and the commissioner would argue that now he you know, experienced wage loss because he can't go back to his 50 pound job if he was earning more or whatever. So, we'll about that. Another question, Jigger? Yeah. Uh, you said that the uh, um, the second second surgery, the medical bills weren't paid by either employer. Uh, right. Did he receive TTD, Mr. Ham? Uh, no, no. We, I mean, we didn't pay TTD. Uh, there was there was, was, there, was there a uh, penalty man. petition filed? I'm sorry. Was there a penalty petition filed? There was no penalty petition. We did issue an advance. Uh, or TTD after he's played soft work on subsequent accidents just to, you know, we had permanency exposure. I thought it was reasonable to issue in advance to get the guy some money while we got the case to hearing. Um, and now given the award, I mean, we're just taking a credit for that advance that we paid in issuing the outstanding portion of the award. Say that's like a dollar 15 cents on interest. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.